What is the goal of this man's doctrine? I asked myself, and the answer was clear. He seeks to undo and wipe out everything that man has accumulated by experience, whatever has been won in the struggle for mastery and supremacy, everything that tradition has ratified, whatever custom and law have validated, everything that has been cultivated and is controlled by institutions, rulers, and spiritual leaders, and to create in their place a new world and a new order founded on diametrically opposed principles. The things that we regard as virtues, as the highest achievements of man's peculiar and separate greatness, he would condemn as vices and defects, and contrariwise, vices and defects are exalted by him into high moral commandments, the truly good which has subdued the world and laid it at the feet of man." not dignity and pride, which have hammered out the character of man, but weakness and submission, lowliness, modesty, and softness. These will inherit the earth, and theirs will be the kingdom of heaven, not wealth, accumulated by industry and conquest, but poverty, the consequence of neglect and surrender, that is to be the ideal of mankind." to avoid anger and hatred, which are the parents of battle and victory, to renounce, to love your foe, to fly from the battlefield before you have set foot on it, to forgive your enemies their sins, in order that your Father in heaven may forgive you yours, not to taste the pleasures of life and the glory and abundance of wealth, not to give free rein to the natural passions so that they may live themselves out in the fullness of their strength and marrow, but to repress and deny them, to burn them out. If your right eye offend, pluck it out. If your right hand offend, cut it off. Carry eternal sadness in your heart, but do not let your face betray it. When you fast, anoint your head and wash your face." I came to the conclusion that this man was wholly different from all the Jewish teachers and interpreters of the law who had preceded him. Those others applied the law only to the chosen of the people, whose character and condition made them fit for it, while they refused to concern themselves with those that were not of their own. But the doctrine of this rabbi was baited for the simple and credulous of all peoples, even the heathens. For, to begin with, he did not confine himself to the narrow service of their temple and their religious customs, like the high priest and his class. He used words which spread out a net for all men. There are altogether too many Romans susceptible to the mysticisms and spiritual savageries of our conquered enemies. It is a weakness with us that makes us bend our heads before the gods of barbarians and offer sacrifices in their temples, not to speak of the verminous and crafty Greeks who consider themselves our superiors with their culture, art, and philosophy, and despise us as imitative apes. They rule us, not we them." They instill their tastes and their outlook into us through the teachers and educators whom we purchase in the slave markets. The Egyptians and Chaldeans, too, have infected us with their magic, their fire-swallowing and their snake-charming through their women, and it is no secret that the highest circles in Roman society have always been fond of toying with Jewish ideas— but the full significance of the danger came home to me only when I saw with my own eyes in Kafar Nahum how the magic wielded by a Jewish rabbi could lead a Roman commander to deny the Roman gods, betray the Roman character, and transform himself into a soft and sentimental Asiatic dreamer and visionary." nor was he the only one of his kind. Among the Caesareans and Ascalonites included in the multitudes which followed the rabbi, I had caught, now and again, glimpses of officers. If, as yet, they had not gone as far as the centurion of Kafar Nahum, they might well do so before long. 
I saw in this man the epitome of all dangers, of all uprisings, of all the teeth-grinding and fist-shaking, all the impotent fury which the name of Rome awakened in the hearts of the Jews. I foresaw the destruction which they were capable of bringing on us. He was a more desperate enemy than Carthage had been of old, or any other hostile state since then. This was the war which Judea had declared on Rome, a war not of the sword, but, to use their phrase, of the Spirit of God. We would have to take them in hand before it became too late.